Gibraltar is blessed with a rich variety of natural and human history. The rock and the town below have been home to many cultures and people over the centuries. The artifacts, monuments and memories that remain become our heritage. And as Gibraltar moves forward and grows, it is up to us as a society to make sure this heritage endures and becomes a part of our future as well. Gibraltar's role as a military fortress has made it an iconic symbol of strength and military might. Its dominant elevation over the straits has served as a way to control passage in and out of the Mediterranean. Maybe the most iconic of all are the Upper Ridge batteries, positioned at the very peak of the rock. Vital to Gibraltar's strategic importance, these guns were capable of firing at any ships approaching from the Med or the Atlantic, as well as covering the North African coast and being able to take a wide range of targets in the Spanish mainland. Decommissioned in the 1970s, these guns have been subject to extreme exposure to the elements. Now in a dilapidated state, Gibraltar Heritage Trust trustee Pete Jackson and a team of volunteers have taken the initiative to restore Lord Airy's battery to its former glory. Here we're now at Lord Airy's battery, which is a 9.2 inch gun, forms part of what was known as the Ridge Batteries during World War II. So we have O'Hara's on the, on the tip, Lord Airy's set back and breakneck beyond us, uh, just a little further back within the MOD estate. But if you'd like to come down inside, we'll have a look at what uh, state the gun's in underneath. So these rooms have been left for so long they're in a real state. And this room you can see was a workshop for the gun itself, so a, a gun room. That's what we call a shadow board, so that would have had the tools relevant to carrying out jobs uh, within this area. Uh, I've managed to get it r relatively clean, clean enough for me to bring my tools down, put them out so we can actually work on this project. Uh, but there's several levels to the gun. We're, I'll, I'll take you through into the next room where uh, we can look at some of the equipment that needs uh, restoration and then we'll drop down into the magazine itself and have a look at what it was like in World War II. So into this room which is where we're going to uh, make air pressure for the gun. The, where you see the red handles there behind there should be three large cylinders uh, which would generate the oxygen required or the CO2 to assist the recoil system of the gun. The tanks are, are long gone and some, someone, since the place has been open and left uh, unattended, had actually opened the drain taps on the motors and ran the oil across the floor. So my current job is to get this clean. The lads that are assisting us, the, the Fortress of Gibraltar group are the, the guys that are going to be carrying this out, supported by the Ministry for Heritage and the Gibraltar Heritage Trust, who are helping a, a bit with the, with the funding and the back end to get this project up and running. It's definitely not an overnight job. You can see a lot to be done and we just need to get it clean. We, if we can get it clean and get the start base, we can then take it forward and turn it into something that uh, is fitting for people to come in and see and safe for people to come in and see. So, so many years of neglect See, all the paint is now flaking off and this is something that very slowly we can get all this off and start to, to repatch and, and make good. I, I don't expect it to look like it did when soldiers were down here in 1943, but at least we can get it looking uh, something like. And into this room you can see this is where the shells for the gun would be stored. The hoisting gear, you can see, is, is still, still in heavy care and preservation. So this, I'd like to leave very much as is. There's a lot of work to be done about it, as I say, but initially just the cleaning side of it and the arresting of the rust. There is a great deal that needs rust treatment if this is to survive for many years uh, after us. What we have here is the ammunition hoist to take shells uh, and cartridges from where we are, uh, from the safety of the magazine up to the gun above. So that's where the loading will occur. So all the ammunition is kept safe down here, and then as, as required, it's loaded and taken to the top. There's uh, several of these still about. One in O'Hara's battery in better condition, but, uh, and I know this looks like it's beyond repair. I don't want it to be working, I just want to arrest the rust and preserve what we have 
uh, for future generations. This, this little motor is what starts it. We're not gonna, we're not gonna start it up, but as you can see, the starting handle's still on it and she's still got compression there. Uh, and it, all she needs is, is cleaning up uh, so it's presentable for people to come and see. And you can see that we have the electric lights in that would have been World War II and before, but this magazine predates electric. So you'll find all these lighting areas where you could put a lantern in and close it in with glass behind it so you don't get the, the flame in your magazine. And these are still in existence, which indicates to us this is pre-electric. So the battery's been here many, many years. So I mean, the location is awesome. And uh, being up here on the ridge, you can see how the weather takes its effect. I mean, the barrel is in such a state now Nobody says this is going to be an easy job, uh, but if things were easy, these things would not be here. These were brought here by soldiers many years ago, put in place for a job. I believe they are worthy of our attention. This one, if we don't do something about it, we are eventually going to lose it. I believe that they cannot be lost. We, we cannot afford to lose our heritage in this fashion. Uh, luckily we have the interest groups such as the Gibraltar Heritage Trust and, and the Fortress of Gibraltar Group. We have people that are trying their very best, but this isn't a simple add water and stir for instant repair. This is going to take time, it's going to take effort. As I mentioned before, nobody says it's going to be easy, but if we don't do something about it, yet another part of our heritage will be gone. Three months on, we're, we're moving on slowly. It's, it's not happening overnight. We've got um, some good progress down in the uh, ammunition rooms below, in that we've got the majority of the ammunition hoist, stripped back, rust treated, painted. The walls, we've managed to get a coat of white paint on most of the ammo hoist room. Still lots to go. I am reliant on volunteers coming to assist because there are certain jobs I just cannot do on my own. I need extra hands. So when the volunteers do come up, it's a real shot in the arm, it's, it's, and it's most appreciated. Um, I've had five volunteers so far, and Carl Alessio, bless him, um, very, very talented lad when it comes to uh, manual dexterity. He's done so much uh, good work down there It'd be good to have him back and uh, assist him a bit more, but he's a busy lad, he, he works hard. This starts back from as when I was quite young. Um, I used to like taking things to bits, restoring them, trying to make them new again. I come from a military background anyway. I've got my, my whole family, one point or the other, been in the regiment or overseas uh, regiment. I noticed people was uh, working on a, a couple of guns and I said, I always said to them, Pete, if you need a hand, just you know, let me know. And I'd be more than happy to uh, give you a hand and you know, share my knowledge of um, you know, preparing and painting and re you know, rest restoration. We both believe the same on the history, how it should be kept, how it should be restored and remembered. So uh, that's how he got me on board basically. And obviously the free time, what I could have on weekends and on my lunch breaks, obviously here at work, um, you know, helping Pete, trying to put his his dream of this big project together. Cannons and heritage, it's, it's, the weather doesn't do it any good and it's deteriorating pretty quick. These are the original information what actually used to be in the back of these signal boxes. And these signal boxes, they used to give signals to each gun and command post. And obviously, as you, as you can see, it's, it's just deteriorated. 
So basically what I'm doing, I'm, I don't even got to take these out because they just fall out anyway. And I'm just replacing them with a photocopy which I cut out. And then once all this is cleaned, then it's just varnished, varnished in and then varnished over. So it gives that same glossy eff effect. With this one, you've still got all the original paint. Um, this one, I've completely taken the paint off, so it's nice, it's nice and smooth now, ready to ready to paint. Completely stripped with the original plaque. What goes here? So this will be the last thing which I put on. These with the screws. How they made it back then, they don't make it now. So obviously, once you start scraping all the all that paint off, all the layers and years of old paint you start seeing all the details and the actual craftsmanship of that item. And obviously my job is to take all the paint off and bring that back to life, back to how it would have been 100 years ago when, when they actually installed the gun and the components in um, where they are now. I mean, obviously as you can see with these, the, the, the amount of layers of paint, you, you lose a lot of the actual information, the date, um, the military, the military arrow, which you, you actually lose. So the less paint you got on it, the more detail you actually see. So if, if you use good, good quality paints, then you can actually have a nice coat of paint, and you can still see all the detail. And then I put a special metal primer, and then with the deep bronze green, uh, which uh, Pete Jackson uh, sourced for me, which is the original paint. I give it a, two coats of paint, thin layers of paint. And then that is ready, basically, to go back onto the, onto the panel. This is what I'm doing now. So obviously I need to, I need to finish painting, the, stenciling the right in here. And this is one, these are two which I need to be getting on with. As you can see, these are a lot heavier because they're actually iron. So because it's iron, all the rust is starting to come through. And we know with, with rust, it starts uh, becoming like puff pastry and they just start breaking away. And once they're broke, you're never going to get them again. And it's, it's, a, it's a shame. But it's a slow work because it's, it's a preparation. You have to prepare everything, which that's what takes the time. Um, painting it doesn't take that long. The preparation is taking the paint off. As you can see, I've just painted it. Now the paint comes off. I get an hour lunch, so I spend an hour each day um, actually doing doing what I can. And most weekends, obviously, I have a family and all, which I have to uh, keep keep happy, you know. So, which my family are quite good. They do. They they know my heart's really into it, and it's for a good cause. So um, that's why I don't mind putting the hours in most weekends and bank holidays and well, when I when when I can really. So I wish I had more time so I could. Uh, so I could be up there with Pete all the time. Do you know what I mean? That would that would be nice um, because this is what I've always enjoyed doing, and this is you know what I will continue to do. I'm learning as I'm going along because you know I've never I never used to work on this gun, so I've, I'm really enjoying it. It's really good. Yeah, a lot of people just see the gun on top, but they don't see everything else what goes below. It was in, it was in, in, incredible. I mean, nowadays it's just a flick of a button. Back then it was proper heavy duty work, which I think a lot of people has forgot. And there's only a handful of people in Gibraltar left who was in Gibraltar Regiment at the time who actually used the 9.2 inch gun and they know about it. So obviously talking to them, getting their history off of them, you can, you, you're hearing it first hand. And soon we'll, that'll be lost. Soon that'll be lost. That's why we need to protect what we have and um, you know, record, record everything before it's too late. I came to know these guns because I enrolled in the, in the then TA and you had three choices when you joined. You either joined the heavy troop, which is what served the 9.2s, the air defense troop, which at the time had the L4070 anti-aircraft gun, and all the infantry. I just chose the, 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 uh, the heavy troop, which was the 9.2, so that, that's basically why I ended up firing these guns. My position on the gun was line layer. It's a beautiful position, really, because you actually you're the one who aims the gun via telescope onto the target and literally fires it, because 
at my feet had a pedal which activated a dynamo. So when the gun number one set fire, all I had to do was just kick the pedal, produce electric charge, which in turn would fire the gun. When the gun went bang, the blast was nothing out of this world because these, these guns are very, uh, the mass of velocity is very low. And all of a sudden you see that cloud of smoke coming out of the barrel and lots of pieces of debris from the charge bags. Once that cleared, you could then look through the telescope and see, for the, and see the follow shot. These guns were very accurate. Well, to say these guns were very accurate is important. It's an understatement. We used to aim the gun at a piece of wood, a meter square, two of them were towed in tandem behind, be, behind the RAF launch at approximately 100 meters be, between them. And we used to aim the gun at those one meter pieces of wood moving across the straits. Not only that, the rounds that were fired were just a piece of steel. They were plugged. This ammunition carries a fuse in the front, an impact fuse, or a point detonating fuse, that on impact will, will, will explode the round. These rounds were never fired with fuses. In place of the fuse, there was a plug. That means that when the round hit the sea, it was just a piece of steel hitting the sea. There wasn't a, 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 an explosion that would uh, increase the damage area of, of the round. So basically we were aiming a piece of steel at a, a meter square piece of wood and we would hit that meter piece of wood at 12, 14,000 yards out in the straight. That gives you the accuracy of the gun. Incredible. Very much ahead of its time. After all these years, although I've been here a couple of occasions, but what brings back memories is actually firing it. And that, that, that was the, the apex of the, of the whole operation, all the training and training and training, and then actually firing it. Uh, that, that, that was the, the, the climax of a lot of hard work, a lot of training, ah, but again, very much worth it. But many, many, many years ago, many, many years ago, 1972 yesterday. Uh, incredible. These guns had two means by which they were fired, or at least aimed at the target, or, or target acquisition. One being telescope laying, i.e. you look through the telescope and then you would move the gun, point the gun onto the target, same for the Asian layer. Once you aim the gun at the target, you fired, and then you have the follow, the, the, the follow shot. The other means is indirect laying. FCS came into play when, when we had no option but to fire indirectly, i.e. should there be a mist up here or you couldn't see the target. Then they would predict the information that was relevant to the gun to fire at the target. So from here you can see the observation slits uh, for fire control south, the upper and the lower. Uh, so you can also make out the proximity to, uh, to O'Hara's battery on the top of the rock. You can just make out the barrel sticking out there. So it does give you some idea when you, when you look across this area how it dominates the straits and the entrance to the Med, obviously. So the entrance we've just walked down is one of two entrances to this site. It originally took out as a, a military magazine. Uh, as we come inside the wall behind me here, this is what we call a traverse. And a traverse stops the travel of explosion, basically. So if something goes off on the outside, it's not going to come and affect our magazine. This magazine that we're going to go into and see was converted into generating station uh, some years after. This is the old magazine, as was. Uh, at later years converted into an engine room to support the, the guns that you see on the Ridge batteries at uh, O'Hara's, Lord Aries and so on. 
Uh, so you'll see that these engines have been put into heavy care and preservation at some stage of the past because they weren't an immediate requirement. So in, ter in terms of putting equipment into care and preservation, there's different levels. I mean, if, if a military unit's going away for a short while, they'll put things into light care and preservation. You can see, just looking at this, this is intended to go into what we deem as heavy care and preservation. So these are being looked after for the longer term. Um, so they're not expecting this to come back into use for some time. The intent is that you, know, you, you remove the grease, you degrease it, and it should be back in perfect working order. So I believe this Nissan hut is the last one of its type on the rock uh, of original type. In that there were some um, replicas put in through the 1970s to show what would have been. But you can see this one still has the bitumen, li bitumen lining inside and out to protect it from the elements and the water percolation. Uh, but just looking down the chamber it gives you an idea of the size of these things, especially without uh, equipment inside. So coming into this back end of the whole complex at the higher level, uh, we go into a series of offices and stores. Uh, but it just, I mean, we are underground, so you can see the, the whole of the air filtration system that goes on to allow uh, for clean air to be you know, d delivered into each of these stores. Without that, stores are going to rot or things are going to become unlivable. So we have to have that air forced in. In this room you can see, obviously this was used for uh, signals. We've got a lot of signals terminals at the back and behind that you see the battery bank and the boxes all referring to the guns and battery observation posts in different places. The desks on this side are obviously for signalers or, or telephone operators uh, to operate from within. When you fire an artillery piece, it's not that simple. You have to take certain things into consideration. One being the range to the target, the mass of velocity of the gun, which is, which is a low one, that means the round is in the air for a long time. When the round is in the air, the earth doesn't stop. The earth keeps rotating. So you have what is called rot. You have to comp compensate because if not, the, the, the round will not fall where it's meant to be. The barrel is, is rifled. So when the round reaches the barrel, it's turning clockwise. And, if, and gradually, it turns to the right. That's called drift. That also has to be compensated. The weather conditions, the wind conditions, that because the round is in the air for a long time and low mass of velocity, the wind would affect the, the follow shot. All that was put into the predictor, right? And the information that came out will be transferred to the gun. Again, they have a match pointer system whereby down in FCS, they would move certain levers and send up electronically if the information that they would, that they would uh, seem fit to hit the target. So we've now come into what's really the sharp end of the observation post for the guns. So this is the main battery observation post. We have two levels to it. This is the upper level. The lower level is very similar. Uh, we'd have uh, range finders within uh, for pinging out to targets to give us distance to and from targets. So we can then translate that information back to the guns in terms of bearing and elevation required to bring accurate fire down on any target that we've acquired. This location is picked because the, the views across the straits here are so commanding and stunning. It's, it's the perfect location. The levels of history within this site from entering from a magazine which is then converted into the engine room, taking you from the 1800s into the 1900s, right up through World War II. We've got so many artifacts and relics in this site. It's, it's stunning. This does require to be saved. To what level we can take that without detracting from what we see is something else, but it really does need to be preserved.
this 9.2 area, Oharas and, and Roderis, are very much part of, of our heritage. Uh, not only regimental heritage, but Gibraltar heritage. They, they remember that, that this place was manned by Gibraltarians during the war and after the war. So really the, 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 the tie-in to, to local soldiers and local personnel. I mean, the, 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 the guns have been unfortunately going to the dogs for many years. And now, because of the initiative of, of, of Pete Jackson and, and his colleagues, they're trying to bring, bring it back to some sort of refurbished state. I know there's a lot more history in Gibraltar than just one, one gun, and I would like to see everything, you know, all their Gibraltar history restored back to his uh, former glory. And at the end of the day, that is, this is what protected our rock, so we need to protect, protect it back in the end, you know? Guns aside, there are so many sites in Gibraltar of, of key importance that require saving. I mean, we are sat on one of the greatest pieces of military history that you could wish to go to in Europe. And we need to make sure that we, we preserve and we show off and showcase what we have.